I think the problem that policymakers have, uh, humanitarians have, and systems builders have, is they tend to reduce each and every living, breathing human being to a number and to a statistic. That then gives you no capacity for empathy and no capacity to fully understand uh, the, the reality of what you're trying to change. One of the first things that happens when you come here is that you know, your preconceived notions are thrown out the window. Charles is always pushing us to go to the edges of the world and see how other people live. So firstly, going out there is just a true appreciation for another type of lifestyle. We've been here in Mongolia now for a, a few days. Uh, it's been a fascinating time so far. I think if you're gonna try and understand truly how the product that you're creating is gonna change lives, you need to meet some of those people and have just a little bit of a window into those lives. If you understand anything about the traditional banking industry and how the capital markets work and how the world works in general, they have made it a closed system. They've made it impossible for you to thrive. They made it impossible for you to have access to liquidity. That's what blockchain is. We're pushing forward to open banking services up to everybody. In the last few years, blockchain and the interest in blockchain in Mongolia has just exploded with multiple exchanges and uh, 140,000 people, I understand, holding ADA um, within this country. Even though we feel sometimes we're going to remote places, ultimately the world is an extremely small place when it comes to shared vision, shared future, shared mission. And I think Cardano allows people to unite around that and it's palpable to feel the energy and the passion for Cardano in places like this. Our population is only 3 million, but I think the development of cryptocurrency is um, fastly growing here in Mongolia, and especially among the youngsters, we are uh, learning about cryptocurrency in a fast pace, and that's a good thing. Mongolia, more than 50% of the population is very young, and everybody is into blockchain lately, so everybody is interested, and uh, everybody is expecting something big in the future. This sector is all about expertise and knowledge. People are really truly competing with their expertise here. So from this perspective, this interaction with successful international actors, that's what makes difference. And when you are competent and knowledgeable, then you become competitive. How do you give economic agency to these people? What do they actually require? You're not there to change everything. You're not there to say your nomadic lifestyle is wrong. Come integrate into the city. Come live this particular way. What you're trying to say is that you get a choice of how you want to live, where you want to live, the things you want to do in life, the things you value. But when you want to integrate with the global financial markets, just because you chose to live as a nomad out in the middle of Western Mongolia in the mountains doesn't mean that you're now disadvantaged. Systems are only fair when the least amongst us have equal access to the greatest amongst us. Then you can start having a real conversation about the particular problems that they face on a daily basis. What does digital identity mean in a country where 30% of the population are nomads? in a country where you can go from a beautiful city, like right here in Ulaanbaatar, to literally just 20 minutes outside of the city to be hanging out with camel and horse herders who live in tents. There's really few places in the world that have that beautiful paradoxical juxtaposition between the old and the new in that respect. Um, and also this is a country that wants to innovate. Within five years, it might be that they'll have a great national ID system. Within five years, all the land in this country could be digitized in some way. It could be that within five years, everything on the supply chain, there's 80 million animals, uh, 3 million people, but 80 million animals, big ag culture. All of those will probably be digitized in some way. And everybody will be connected in some way. 95% of Mongolians, hermits or otherwise, nomads or otherwise, have cell phones, smartphones. So there's very high penetration of these things. We went to Western Mongolia, to the Kazakh area of Mongolia, and we were hanging out all yesterday with these eagle hunters. And they live in gares, and they live completely off the grid. But we saw a solar panel there. We saw a battery there. You know, we saw 
evidence of a, a modern lifestyle juxtaposed with an ancient lifestyle that would be recognizable to uh, a 12th century person from Mongolia. Blockchain technology can be used for financial services, but can be used for all kinds of other things that have nothing to do with financial services. And one of the examples that we've talked to government officials here in Mongolia are food supply chain. You know, there's this huge, robust rural agricultural population and economy, and the more that they can manage the integrity of that food supply chain, the better off they are. And it also even makes it easier for them to export that now to other countries. It's not just about saying, how do we get people into the current state of the art? Because the state of the art is going to change very quickly. How do you get people into a system that can always stay in the state of the art because it upgrades? So anytime you can get a social system into software, then you move at the speed of thought as society. If you get a social system into hardware, the whole system falls apart at some point because you age out of the assumptions of the old system. If you adopt a great identity management system, it's the gift that keeps on giving, just a digital identity, because then you have a credential management system, you have a voter registration system, you have a system to sign legal contracts, you have a value transfer system, you have a system that enables a password-free internet, you have a system that prevents identity theft, you have a system that allows you to much more easily do research on who owns things. Once you've built it for a single nation, it's useful for all nations. When you have something here and here and here and they're all using the same things, these are your neighbors. If they upgrade something, you get it for free. If they build something, you get it for free. If your credentials are interoperable with each other, then all of a sudden the concept of visa-free travel, uh, immigration, these other things, that becomes much easier, more palatable because the overhead of those things disappears. If you're already managing it for your own people, you're interoperable with the people of other nations that have adopted this type of system. So those people can now freely flow between each other. And wherever you do that, again, you get more peace, more economic opportunity, more liquidity, and ultimately a better and freer society where people have more empathy for each other and understand each other at their core.